Holmes took the blue diamond in his hand and looked at it. What a beautiful thing, he said. Look at the wonderful colours in it. Dark blues and cold whites. All big jewels make people into thieves and killers in the end. This one comes from the south of China, near the Amoy River. It's only twenty years old, so it's a young thing. But already, many terrible crimes are happening because of it. I'm going to put it in my safe now, and then let's write a letter to the Countess of Morca, and say we have her beautiful blue diamond here with us. But Holmes, I said, I don't understand. Is that young man Horner innocent after all? I don't know. And what about Henry Baker, the tall man with the hat and the goose? Is he the jewel thief, perhaps? No, I don't think he is. I believe he's an innocent man. I don't think he knew there was an expensive diamond in his goose, a jewel worth more than twenty thousand pounds. But let's wait and see. Perhaps Mr. Baker's going to answer our advertisement this evening, and then we can learn something more about him. All right, I said. I can come back after work this evening. I'm very interested in the answer to this case. Good, replied Holmes. Dinner is at seven o'clock. I got to Baker Street at six thirty that evening. There was a tall man already at Sherlock Holmes's front door when I came down the street. He wore a long winter coat, and had a Scottish hat on his head. When I arrived next to him, the door opened. Mrs. Hudson, Holmes's housekeeper. Said, "Good evening" to the two of us, and we went in and upstairs to Holmes's room. Mister Henry Baker, I believe," said Holmes to the man when he came in. "Please, sit down." Holmes looked at me and smiled. "Ah, Watson, good." You are here when we need you. Then he looked back at his other visitor. Is that your hat, Mister Baker? Mister Baker looked at the hat on the chair. Yes, sir.、Oh, that's my hat. There is no question about it. He was a big man with a big head. An intelligent face, and grey hair. I remembered Holmes's words about him. He wore a dirty old black coat, with no shirt under it, but he spoke slowly, quietly, and carefully. I looked at him, and listened to him, and I thought, yes, this is an intelligent man. He was rich once, but now he has no money, and things aren't easy for him. We found your hat and your goose some days ago," said Holmes. "But we couldn't find you very easily, Mister Baker. We didn't know your address. Why didn't you put an advertisement in the newspaper with your address in it?" We waited and waited for an advertisement from you, but saw nothing. Mister Baker smiled.、Oh, I'm sorry. Advertisements are expensive, and I haven't got a lot of money these days.
I had once, but not now, he went on. And, well, I thought those young men in Tottenham Court Road had my hat and my goose, and I didn't want to put an expensive advertisement in the newspaper for nothing. I understand, said Holmes. Now, before we say more, I must tell you something about your goose, Mr. Baker. I'm sorry, but, well, we ate it yesterday, you know. You ate it, said our visitor, and he stood up excitedly. Yes, well, we didn't want it to go bad, you see. But we bought a nice new goose this morning for you. It's on the table there, by the door. Is that all right for you? Oh, yes, yes, said Mr. Baker happily. He sat down again. And let's see. I think we have your old goose's feet, head, and everything from inside it in the kitchen. Do you want those? The man laughed. No, no, he said. But I'd like to take that nice new goose home with me. Thank you very much. Sherlock Holmes looked at me with a little smile. Very well, he said to Mr. Baker. There is your hat, and there is your bird. Please take them. Oh, and uh, before you go, can you tell me something? Where did you get your goose? I know a lot about geese, and that was a very good bird, I can tell you. Well, sir, said Baker. He stood up and took his hat and the goose in his hands. I got that bird at the Alpha, a pub near the British Museum. This year, the owner of the pub, Mr. Windygate, began a goose club. Every week, we all put five or six pence into a money box, and at Christmas time, we all had the money for a goose. With that, he said goodbye and left. Well, said my detective friend, that answers one question. Mr. Baker is not our diamond thief. Are you hungry, Watson? Ooh, no, not very. Let's eat later, then. We must go to the Alpha at once. We need to speak to Mr. Windigate tonight. Holmes and I put on our coats and hats and went out into the cold winter street. The sky was dark over our heads. We walked east, and in a quarter of an hour we stood in front of the Alpha. Holmes opened the door and we went in. In the pub, the owner, Mr. Windigate, gave us some beer. Is this beer good? Holmes asked him. I ask because I know your geese are very good. Mr. Henry Baker told us all about your goose club. Oh, yes, but those geese weren't our geese. They came from a man with a little shop in Covent Garden. Breckinridge is his name. Thank you. My good man, said Holmes. We paid for our beer and drank it. Then we walked out of the warm pub and into the cold night again. Now for Covent Garden, said Holmes. And we walked down the street past the British Museum. Remember, Watson, it all began with a goose but it finishes with seven years in prison for young Mr. Horner. Perhaps we can learn more about this interesting case 
in Mr. Breckinridge's shop. We walked south and soon came to Mr. Breckinridge's shop. A Breckinridge and a boy were at the door. It was nearly time to close for the night. Good evening. It's a cold night, said Holmes. How can I help you? asked Breckinridge. Holmes looked at the empty shop window. No geese, I see, he said. There are some in that other shop, there behind you. Ah, but I came to you because I hear your geese are very good. A Breckinridge's birds are the best, he said. Who said that? The owner of the Alpha. Ah, yes. He had twenty-four of my geese two days before Christmas. They were very good birds, too. Where did you get them? I'm not going to tell you, said Breckinridge angrily. Again and again, people come and talk to me about those geese, and I don't like it. I paid good money for them. I took them to the Alpha, and then I forgot all about them. And then all the questions began. Where are the geese? How much do you want for them? Who did you sell them to? Why are people interested in them? I don't know. They aren't the only geese in London, you know. I know, said Holmes. But who asked you all those questions before? Not me. I had nothing to do with that, you know. But now I need your help. We ate a goose at the Alpha, and I say it was a country goose. But my good friend, Dr. Watson here, says it was a London goose. Which of us is right? It's an important question. Five pounds goes to the winner. Well then, you lose, and your friend is the winner, said Breckinridge. That goose came from London. I can't believe that, said Holmes. A pound says I'm right. Very well, said Holmes, and he took out a pound. I'm ready to pay, but I know you're going to lose your money. Breckinridge laughed. Bring me the books, Bill, he said. The boy brought two books to him. Breckinridge opened the little one. This is my address book, he said. When people sell their geese to me, their addresses go in here. Country people on the left and town people on the right. The numbers after every name are page numbers in my big book. Read out the third name on the right, said Breckinridge. Mrs. Oakshot, 117, Brixton Road, number 249, read Holmes. Then Breckinridge opened the big book. And this is my inn and out book, he said. Let's look at page 249. Here we are. Mrs. Oakshot. What can you see for December the 22nd? 24 geese from Mrs. O, Red Holmes, all 24 to Mr. Windigate at the Alpha. There. What do you say now? said Breckinridge. Holmes put his pound into Breckinridge's hand angrily. In the street, Holmes stopped. But suddenly, he wasn't angry. He began to laugh. You see, Watson, he said, Breckinridge didn't want to tell me Mrs. Oakshot's name and address at first. But later, 
when he saw he could easily get a pound from me, he told me everything. And he said something very interesting when he got angry. Did you hear? Other people are asking questions about those geese. Suddenly, there was a lot of noise from Mr. Breckinridge's shop behind us. We looked back at it. Breckinridge stood, tall and angry, in front of his shop door. A weak little man stood in front of him in the street. Look, you! Breckinridge shouted. I don't want to hear any more about those geese. Mrs. Oakshot can come and speak to me when she wants, but not you. You have nothing to do with it. Did I get the geese from you? No, but one was my goose, I tell you, cried the little man. Then ask Mrs. Oakshot for it. But she told me, ask Mr. Breckinridge for it. Well, that's nothing to do with me. I don't want to hear any more from you. Do you understand? Now go away. Breckinridge closed his shop door angrily, and the little man ran off down the dark street. Perhaps we don't need to visit Mrs. Oakshot in Brixton Road after all, said Holmes to me quietly. Let's talk to that man. Perhaps he can help us. Holmes walked quickly up behind the little man and put a hand on his shoulder. The man stopped and looked back over his shoulder at us. His face was white. Who are you? What do you want? He asked weakly. Excuse me, said Holmes. But I heard your questions to that shop owner. I think I can help you. Uh, who are you? And how can you help me? My name is Sherlock Holmes, and it's my job to know things other people don't know. But you can't know anything about this. Excuse me, I know everything. You want to find twenty-four geese. Mrs. Oakshot of Brixton Road sold them to Mr. Breckinridge here. He sold them to Mr. Windygate, the owner of the Alpha, and Mr. Windygate sold them to the people in his goose club. Oh, sir, this is wonderful. Oh, I'm very happy to meet you said the little man excitedly. You are right. I am very interested in those geese. Oh, more than I can say. Why don't we go to a warm room in my house for a talk, then? I don't like standing here in the cold street. Holmes put out his arm, and a cab stopped for us. But before we go... Can you please tell us your name? The little man looked at Holmes and then at me before he answered. Uh, j j j j j John Robinson, he said. No, no, said Holmes quietly. We'd like to know your real name, please. The stranger's face changed from white to red. Oh, very well. My real name is James Ryder, he said. Well, 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 said Holmes. Assistant manager of the Cosmopolitan Hotel. Now, let's get into the cab and go home. Then I can tell you everything you want to know. So, we got into the cab and went home. Ryder looked excited, but said nothing. 
Holmes didn't speak at all in the cab. Arrived at 221B Baker Street, we got out of the cab and went in. Back in his sitting room, Holmes spoke at last. Please sit down, Mr. Ryder. Now, where were we? Ah, yes. You want to know what happened to those twenty-four geese. Or perhaps, what happened to one of those geese. You are interested in only one bird, I think. A white goose with a black tail. Oh, sir, Ryder said excitedly. Where did that bird go to? It came here. And it was a most interesting bird. We found something in it after it died. The most wonderful thing. Here it is. Our visitor stood up weakly. Holmes opened his safe and took out the blue diamond. In his hand, it was cold and beautiful. Ryder looked at the jewel, but said nothing. Holmes spoke for him. We know it was you, Ryder, he said. Sit down and have a drink. You look very weak. I gave Ryder a drink. He sat down and drank it quickly and looked at Holmes. I saw he was afraid. You don't need to tell me much, said Holmes. I know nearly everything about the case, but I have one or two questions to ask. How did you hear of the Countess of Morka's blue diamond? Oh, Catherine Cusack, her maid, told me, said Ryder. I see, Holmes went on. So you and Cusack wanted to get the diamond and sell it for lots of money. You asked John Horner to come and repair the window in the room because you knew of his time in prison. When he left, you took the diamond from the Countess's jewel box. Then you called the police. They came at once. Because of Horner's time in prison, they believed he was the thief. It was all very easy. Then, oh, please, please, cried Ryder, now on the floor at Holmes's feet. Think of my father. Think of my mother. I never did anything wrong before. I'm never going to do it again. Please don't tell the police. I don't want to go to prison. Sit down in your chair, said Holmes coldly. You're crying now, but did you feel sorry for young Horner? He knew nothing of this crime, but the police believed he was a diamond thief, and so he went to court and he is now going to prison, all because of you. I can leave the country, Mr. Holmes. Then, when I don't go to court, Horner can leave prison. We can see about that later, said Holmes. But now, please tell me, Mr. Ryder, how did the diamond get from the hotel into a goose? And how did the goose get into a shop? And please, tell the truth. Ryder began. When the police arrested Horner, I left the hotel with the diamond in my pocket. I didn't want to stay at the Cosmopolitan not with the police everywhere, looking at everything. So I went to my sister's house in South London. 
She lives in Brixton Road with her husband, Mr Oakshot. I saw lots of police officers on my way there, and when I got to Brixton Road, I was very afraid. What's the matter? my sister asked. I told her about the diamond thief and about the police arresting Horner. Then I went into the back garden to smoke and think. What could I do with the diamond now? In the garden, I remembered my friend Maudsley. He began well, but he went bad, and in the end he went to prison for his crimes. Perhaps he knows about selling diamonds, I thought. So I decided to visit him at his home in Kilburn in North London. But how can I walk across London with the diamond? I thought. I can't have it in my pocket, not with all those police officers in the streets. Then I looked down at the geese in the garden, and I thought of something. I knew one of those geese was for me, for my Christmas dinner. So I decided to take my goose there and then, and not to wait for it. I quickly caught a big white goose with a black tail. Then I took the diamond from my pocket and put it into the bird's mouth. I felt the jewel go down its neck. With the diamond now inside the goose, I felt happy. I could walk to Kilburn and back easily. Then my sister came into the garden. What are you doing with that goose? she said. I put my bird down and it ran off with the other geese. That's the goose I want for Christmas, I said. Very well, catch it, kill it and take it with you, she said. Well, Mr. Holmes, I caught that bird, killed it, and took it with me to Kilburn. There I told my friend Maudsley all about the diamond, and he laughed and laughed. We got a knife and opened the goose, but we couldn't find the diamond. I knew then something was wrong. I left the goose with Maudsley, ran to my sister's house, and went into the back garden. There were no geese there. Where are they all, Maggie? I said. In Mr Breckinridge's shop in Covent Garden. Were there two birds with black tails? I asked. Yes, there were, James, she said and to my eyes one was no different from the other. I understood it all then. The diamond was inside the other goose with the black tail, and that goose was now in Mr Breckinridge's shop. I ran to Covent Garden at once and went to Breckinridge's, but the geese weren't in his shop, and when I asked about them he told me I sold them all at once. But you must tell me, where are they now? I asked again and again, but he never told me. You and Dr. Watson heard him earlier tonight, Mr. Holmes. He never answered my questions. <laughs> now my sister thinks I'm a terrible brother. I'm a thief. I'm going to lose my good name, and I never got any money from my crime at all. Oh, what's going to happen to me? <laughs> he put his head in his hands and began to cry. Holmes didn't speak for a long time. Then, in the end, he stood up and opened the door.
Get out, he said. Oh, thank you. Thank you, sir, said Ryder. Be quiet and get out, said Holmes again. And with that, Ryder ran out of the door, downstairs, out into the street, and away. After all, Watson, said Holmes, it's not my job to do the police's work for them. And young Horner's going to be all right. Ryder isn't going to go to court now. Without him, the police have no witness to say Horner was the thief. Perhaps I'm doing something wrong, but I don't believe it. I think I'm helping Ryder to be a better man. Send him to prison now, and you make him into a thief for life. But now he's afraid. He's not going to go wrong again. We found the solution to the crime, and that makes me happy. And it's Christmas after all. And Christmas is a time to be nice to other people, I believe. And now, Watson, let's ask Mrs. Hudson to bring in our dinner.